dear friends and colleagues, thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar organized by Caucasus Edition, Making Sense of Armenia-Azerbaijan Conflict, Where Are We and What Could Come Next? I am Sevil Husseinova, I am a co-editor of the Caucasus Edition. Um, exactly two years have passed since the Second Karabakh War began. And I remember um, uh, some speakers uh, of our uh, webinars who uh, were kind of uh, very optimistic, were optimistic towards peace. Of course, it was such a keen optimism, but today, unfortunately, we cannot be uh, optimistic. Uh, moreover, uh, during the last year, there have been important changes and very dangerous tendencies towards escalation and uh, deterioration of the relations. Uh, what is happening now? At what level is the negotiation process? What can we expect in the near future? These are the questions we will try to discuss today. And I give the floor to my colleague, uh, Christina Soloyan, who is co-moderating our meeting today. And thank you for your attention. And uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sevil. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Christina. I will be moderating the first uh, session of our webinar. Uh, so this will let me describe the, the structure of uh, our, uh, our plan for today. Uh, we have outlined several key questions that we want to address first uh, in order to try to unpack what is going on, uh, especially recently, what are the interests and positions of the different actors involved, and what are the scenarios that we could expect. Uh, and then we will, of course, open the floor for uh, questions from our audience. If you have questions in mind uh, at this point, you can already submit them in the Q&A section. Uh, and we will, um, in the second part of our webinar, we'll definitely address them and we'll do our best to address as many as possible. Uh, and throughout the webinar as well, please feel free to submit your questions regarding any anything that will be um, um, discussed during the webinar. So as I will feel, well, again, the first question I want to ask you is uh, to share your thoughts. And um, of course, um, there are many numerous different explanations of different events and uh, positions of different actors. But I want to ask you to start with trying to unpack uh, the recent events and the, the recent attack. Uh, and even yesterday, there was an escalation on the border again. How do you explain it, especially that it was followed by a seemingly um, um, active phase of negotiations? And what are the reactions and positions of different actors, first of, of Azerbaijan and Armenia, but also of uh, other in, uh, actors um, from outside involved, actively involved in the uh, process? Um, Russia, the EU, the US, um, uh, and others. So please, uh, who would like to start? Mm -hmm. would, you mind? would you mind going first? Yes, uh, me? Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, actually, uh, what we see, I have never been uh, the one to believe the accidental war, or and therefore I think that all those who believe that the thesis are simply exaggerating the cause and dynamics. Uh, but that's why I see little possibility of the latest escalation being an accidental one. Uh, but it was it was might, might be much more easier to find a rational in what be uh, rational in what happened in the previous escalations. And, uh, do you know, looking to the events, uh, we pay attention to points always. Is it explainable and is it understandable? Uh, often the understandable can be explainable, but or vice versa. But in the latest escalation, I find it, it's very difficult to show understandable and explainable aspects. Uh, especially this came, as you mentioned, that after the meeting, uh, the leaders meeting in Brussels, 
so also there were uh, the chance uh, that the foreign minister will meet and discuss the things. Uh, but however, uh, this event is actually the uh, impacted negatively uh, to to these uh, let's say uh, future events and future the negotiation process there are many uh, we know that uh, the how the the sites are explain the things uh, recently yesterday we uh, crash group published our uh, question and answer session which we uh, describe what the sites are saying and also the what expert community are saying or the pro governmental the people or, or the government uh, uh, representatives. Uh, but uh, from Azerbaijan's point of view, I think Azerbaijan explained that there was a provocation and the provocation, uh, that's why there was a such a reaction. But um, uh, we know that uh, the, the response, at least the military response was unproportional, the response. Uh, so uh, militarily, uh, and that's why it, it is uh, hard to, well, let's say, accept the fact that it was only just uh, uh, the small escalation between the sides. So uh, there are the few, let's say, ideas that uh, are put by people that uh, why this is happening. One, the famous one is about uh, the, the geopolitical distraction or the everyone is focused on the Ukraine events and uh, the main players are uh, paying att attention to the other part of the world rather than in this region. But it's um, it can be one reason, but it, it, it also there is a there are uh, how to say it's hard to only believe uh, this reason because uh, uh, despite let's say the Ukrainian Russian invasion after Russian invasion of Ukraine, we see that uh, still this uh, conflict are getting uh, enough attention. Uh, and uh, the main actors are paying attention, especially the European Union. So uh, that, that, that's why it's hard to believe that only this action is actually a crazy opportunity. About, uh, about this, uh, there are some truths about this, but it's not uh, the, uh, easy to explain. The second thing is actually people are, they believe in Baku that uh, Azerbaijan is rushed to signing the peace agreement. It's especially Azerbaijan is put the peace agreement's uh, signature is a, as a first priority. Uh, rather than that, uh, look into the transport or uh, issues or the delimitation or, or the immigration of uh, uh, the, the borders. So that's why people are, believe that there are very small uh, the timeline for signing uh, any peace deal with Armenia because the future geopolitical events, uh, whether this is related to the Russian uh, Ukrainian, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, or uh, whether it's related to uh, events uh, or election in Turkey. Uh, so that's why Azerbaijan uh, would like to uh, use this opportunity. However, also the people are also discussing that uh, uh, this is also might be related to that Azerbaijan would like to exchange, uh, let's say, to have an upper hand in negotiation on the border, the limitation and immigration process. Uh, so that's why, especially Az Azerbaijan is paying attention mostly to the uh, Azerbaijan villages, eight villages. Uh, some of them are actually Azerbaijan slaves in Armenian territory. So, and uh, this is the one way of uh, getting back in negotiation table. So, all of them can be true. Also, all of them also a uh, little uh, cannot explain all of the situation at all. But one fact that no one is talking. Also, that these events, the escalation, uh, is uh, the second biggest one. Uh, might be the since 2016. Uh, so even the, because of the test toll uh, uh, after 2020 war, this is the biggest one uh, in, in terms of that how people, how much the uh, uh, the soldiers from both sides are are died. Uh, so coming to the, and, and also uh, the, we should also consider that this is also have a negative impact to the Turkish Armenian normalization. So, and actually it's torpedoes this process, Turkish Armenian normalization, Turkish Armenian negotiation, at least uh, for now. We haven't seen such a, actually experts are, are making attention to this issue. So this is general, general let's say, perception is coming from Baku. Uh, but official version is that there was a prov provocation and as always uh, made their countermeasures. Uh, so, uh, and also the one important fact that the first time that since 2020 uh, war in Azerbaijan, we see that some prominent 
figures are talking against uh, the war. It's not only the, we cannot uh, lab, uh, let's say, uh, label these people as a no, no war, let's say, uh, that people, uh, or this is the people are prominent ones, that they, most of them are not a political, uh, let's say, uh, opposition. So people are talking about, and people are against any kind of a new war. And also people are seeing this as a, uh, uh, making a negative uh, effect to the peace process. It's only helping this, uh, let's say, increase the uh, militarized militarization in the, the region and also uh, also will, uh, impacting in, uh, have negative impact on the peace process also the perception of the society so we haven't seen that uh, we should also consider that how the people are uh, let's say perceiving these events how actually uh, decrease their trust to the any kind of a negotiating even peace settlements mm -hmm. So I will I will come back to the role of the uh, international actors, but before might be it's better just to feel answer, uh, let's say how he sees from from other side. Thank you, Zaur. Thank you, Sevil and Christina for starting us off. Uh, frankly, not being on the ground, uh, unlike Zaur, it's a bit harder for me to talk about the perception uh, uh, in Armenia uh, today. I think outside of what you all probably see and follow on social media and from uh, your colleagues and friends. Uh, the, the, so I'll talk about it very briefly and then try to turn into the bigger picture uh, points uh, from my point of view. Uh, when it comes to Armenia, uh, uh, I have been critical of Armenia until 2020 uh, uh, pretty heavily. Whoever followed uh, my work, I think uh, Armenia has been uh, very unjustifiably non-compromising uh, and uh, that led in a big part uh, to the Second Karabakh War. It has a big part of responsibility there. At this stage though, it's very hard for me to see any incentive for Armenia to escalate uh, and go to provocation. Uh, it has nothing to gain militarily, is too weak compared to Azerbaijan, very obviously. So it would be quite uh, suicidal, let's say, to uh, go into open confrontation like that. So I, you know, uh, I uh, see and appreciate that Azerbaijan has that line, but it's very hard to believe it. So just not as an observer. Simply, uh, it's again uh, too dangerous for Armenia to now go to military confrontation. Uh, so that's uh, so because I'll put that aside because of that, and I again uh, while I try to talk about the way I understand what's happening. And uh, the question of understanding is really, I think, what <laughs> bothers so many uh, people I talked to. So uh, if before it was clear what was happening until 2020, right? So it could have disagreed, uh, had wanted uh, peace, but it was understandable essentially what the positions were. Armenians were trying to uh, hold up to Karabakh, uh, believing that it's kind of sub uh, being subject to Azerbaijan is dangerous and unfortunately, uh, the, the recent developments are showing uh, potentially these stories were not uh, unfounded. Uh, and Azerbaijan, uh, of course, had a big number of displaced people who couldn't return and uh, uh, wanted its territorial integrity. So you could understand why there was escalations, why there was intransigence, as much as we disagreed. Uh, what's happening now is much harder to understand. Uh, and uh, because of that, I want to take a bit of a step back and see, say, talk about what stays the same and yet how much changed and why this is a very different conflict from the one we were used to between 1994 ceasefire and 2020. Uh, what stayed the same is that uh, the parties continue to look at this from exclusively from adversarial and kind of mutual enmity position uh, and approach it as such. So uh, all the efforts are really turned to mobilizing or getting alliances, getting external support uh, against the other or maximizing its military power to essentially in some form attack or hold off uh, the other. It never became uh, a case of trying to look at this uh, as a mutual problem that is really endangering uh, the populations of both sides and try to solve this again as something mutual, the mutual problem, which is an important part of conflict resolution, trying to reframe this, reframe a conflict away from adversarial towards a mutual problem. And why it would be important, because really how dangerous uh, the geopolitical situation around us is. If it wasn't maybe that dangerous uh, in 90s and 2000s, so we were really the main danger to each other, 
that has shifted quite a bit in the past few years, and yet we continue not seeing, I'm afraid, uh, the bigger dangers that are around and not still shifting towards cooperation. What changed? Uh, uh, so that's what stays the same. We continue to see each other as the primary adversaries and uh, enemy. And again, uh, in the past, we were kind of left to our own devices. Uh, yes, we were the primary actors. We had the main agency, uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani governments, until 97, also the Karabakh authorities. Uh, they were external actors. There was Russia and uh, many others. But primarily, uh, they weren't necessarily involved uh, as much as they are now. And we could have solved it, the conflict, and we yet chose to continue. But we had the agency in it. Now we have, I would say, at least three very major changes. One is that we, the conflict is effectively now a proxy conflict. It's not yet a proxy war, what we see in uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, but we might get well there. But I would already say it's a proxy conflict. Uh, the obvious difference is compared to before 2020 and now is that we have Russian uh, uh, troops, obviously in Armenia, all along the border with Azerbaijan and Armenia, we have uh, Russian troops in internationally recognized territory of Azerbaijan, uh, uh, more specifically though in Karabakh, of course. Um, we have, we had for the first time in 2010, 20 open involvement of the Turkey in this war, which we didn't see in 90s and later. US is getting extremely active. Uh, the, uh, ironically, I would say the Minsk Group co-chair currently is the highest diplomat US ever appointed. And that comes to that position. And that comes when essentially the Minsk Group is dysfunctional. Uh, and it never came when it was functional. You see activation on the level of the president of the United States, of the uh, secretary of state and so on. So uh, like very strong activation from the US end. So it is becoming again a, a, a case of each side trying to pull like Armenia by extension, Azerbaijan and overall towards kind of its camp in this bigger geopolitical struggle. Again, we are not in a proxy war territory yet, but uh, could it come? I think very much so. Maybe not while uh, Russia is fully involved in Ukraine, but uh, once that war somewhat settled in a six months uh, a year time, uh, then will be much more potential for escalation uh, that involves external actors. So that's one huge, very big difference, I would say, compared to the past. Second difference is that a lot of norms based on which we had a peace process are really non-functional anymore. Uh, on the political level, in the 90s, we had the end of history, and unfamously now, I would say, proclaimed by Fukuyama. The assumption was that liberal democracies won the day and all the solutions were to be to conflicts were to take place within this liberal democracy framework, which had a very specific parameters in a way to uh, how it works. Right? One is democracy and human rights and can be respective of your nationality and background. Everybody was to get uh, enough protection and human rights, including minority rights, that should have made in the long term the conflict uh, somewhat secondary and um, people could live coexist in the same place. So democracy was a very key element of that. Uh, the second part was kind of the Westphalian uh, agreement, essentially, that the, the, the territorial integrity of the states and an agreement that the territories uh, couldn't be uh, violated by different states. And that's where you saw a, a lot of support for years, essentially, for Azerbaijan. Um, and Armenia never could develop any alliances, really, uh, for its claim on Karabakh or uh, independence of Karabakh based on this. Uh, so territorial integrity was an important one. It could have been changed, but it could have been changed uh, through democratic means, right? Such as a referendum uh, that would be internationally recognized and where necessarily the parent state, a uh, former parent state or current state would recognize. Uh, examples we saw the referendums uh, in Quebec or in Scotland or in Catalonia, none of them passed and there was very strong opposition from you know, Spain and so on. Uh, but in principle, it was accepted that were Catalonia to vote in favor, right? So through the, this means Spain would have been forced potentially to accept it and all. Uh, so essentially the mechanisms are very clear. They were through democracy, through referendums, right? Through human rights. Uh, otherwise the borders were seen uh, as uh, you know, very important to maintain. Uh, all of that is really not necessarily functional anymore. Democracy never arrived. And I think uh, 
even the attempts to build it aren't necessarily there or uh, supported and certainly not prioritized. So it's very hard now to imagine Armenians uh, or coexisting within Azerbaijan peacefully uh, since there is no effort being done in that direction or vice versa. Uh, and with the R Russian uh, really uh, annexation of Crimea and upcoming annexation of Donbas, uh, really the question, the territorial integrity question is also uh, not there. We've seen wars de facto, you had annexations, yes, so the, the Northern Cyprus, uh, Abkhazia, and Ossetia might be considered um, annexation by, you know, the Greeks or Georgians and others. But everywhere, this uh, annexing states, let's say, played by the rules in principle. So Russia never formally annexed, uh, Abkhazia or Ossetia, Turkey never annexed, Northern Cyprus. It was all seen as, uh, again, within the norms of people's self-determination, right? So the referendums trying to work the democratic system, essentially. Uh, and these rules are changing. So now suddenly the uh, borders are much less um, immune than they used to be. And today that might favor Azerbaijan, tomorrow that might, you know, I know oil become secondary. 10 years down the road, it might not favor Azerbaijan, uh, but there is a big danger essentially of the borders stop being something that's where we don't know the line is and you cannot cross. Uh, and the third, so this has two differences. Yeah, we are a proxy conflict and the borders are much less, um, secure and uh, importantly, the liberal democratic framework for solution isn't necessarily in place. And that also has repercussions for uh, the peace building, not only on state to state level, but on a society to society level, because that also was functioning in the liberal democratic framework. The idea was that we have, we are to develop strong civil societies, usually understood as NGOs, but not only businesses and uh, religious institutions and others who would build people to people relations uh, and kind of with the loss uh, of prevalence of liberal democratic approach essentially, and nothing coming in its place or whatever is coming is some kind of illiberal uh, authoritarian system, not some kind of post-liberal uh, utopia. So what we've seen is essentially also a collapse uh, of the institutional civil society. Uh, if until about 2016, maybe 14 to 16, we still had about 20 years of very active involvement by civil societies. Now, not super active, but to a degree active. Uh, that is also not non-existent really. And uh, there are practically no uh, NGOs uh, or civil society organizations, the word organization being important, uh, who are really doing anything. So they are completely lost or left the field. Uh, until recently, I would say, despite some complaints, peace building was well funded. Uh, if you look into the numbers coming towards peace building, they weren't that small. Uh, and there were a lot of NGOs that were functioning, kind of professionals trying to do uh, peace building on society, society level. It was pretty well paid job and overall pretty safe. That is not the case anymore. There is much less funding because democracy is not a priority and it's a dangerous job suddenly because societies and nationalist groups are very active. Uh, Armenia between the two is the more democratic state and yet it's very dangerous to work on peace building in Armenia. You might get physically attacked by nationalist groups. Uh, so suddenly it's not anymore a um, kind of cool, interesting, well-paid, safe job. And you, uh, all the NGOs, simply most of the NGOs left the scene or are not working across the border. So these are like all the problems that uh, are underlie uh, why essentially we have no peace process in place. And that's why the escalation is almost uh, uh, a given continually since there is no alternative in place that can move us towards solution. So I'm giving a bit of a big picture. I don't think everything is that bleak by the way, uh, but I talked a lot, so I'll hold off on the positives. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Zaur. Uh, well, the next question uh, I want to move on is, um, well, then, um, based on the descriptions you've provided, what's next? The, uh, and I understand that uh, the developments are very active. There are many closed door meetings and we uh, still need to get to know uh, what will happen next. But uh, what are the different possible scenarios that you envision and also, also taking into account what Phil, you mentioned that this is also becoming a proxy uh, conflict. Therefore, here we should um, 
me measure and weight, not, not just development in Armenia and Azerbaijan and the interest of uh, these two counterparts, but also uh, many other uh, bigger powers and actors involved. Um, are, are, are their intentions serious? What are their interests? What to expect from them as well? Uh, and again, based on all of this, what, what are the scenarios and also possible ways to uh, de-escalate and uh, find uh, the most um, uh, negotiations-based uh, solutions to this situation. Zaur, would you like to say? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, everyone is talking about the peace agreement. And uh, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, people are seeing, most people are seeing the peace agreement as something that the magic way of solving all of the problems between the sides. Uh, however, as we know, uh, there are, you know, that there are the three problems in peace agreements, and you can also label anything as a peace agreement. Uh, so uh, if, if there is no legal obligations, if, if there is no, the, let's say, witness uh, or the legal obligation of the third parties, it's easier to call everything as a peace agreement. But you know that there are three common problems in the peace agreement or the, let's say, even the negotiation solution, if there will be any negotiation solution in the coming months. So first of all, capacity problems. <clears throat> And this is the most benign, and I will say that we, uh, weakness uh, that it's a overestimation of the party's implementation capacity uh, in, in terms of the either scope of the commitments that they have or the implementation. And then political constraints, uh, political weakness is more than just an overestimation of capacity. And the third is a vital concerns. The vital concern is the, uh, the things that the uh, Peace agreement third and most serious flaw uh, that uh, the number of issues vital to either part has not been ad adequately resolved. Uh, so, if you look to the three issues uh, that in Azerbaijan and Armenian case, uh, the capacity issue, uh, I think uh, there are capacity issue, capacity of implementation. Uh, so there are questions about the capacity of implementation, uh, taking into account this, the recent events or taking about the things that uh, is developing the last one year at least. So the second is uh, about uh, the weakness about uh, the political constraints. I mean, I think it is a, it is a, it's much more dangerous in Azerbaijan and Armenia case than the capacity problem because we know that how, uh, let's say this. The latest events, the latest escalation, and also this toll actually created the, the mistrust of the, the peace negotiation or negotiation settlement. How it's going to affect the, uh, the leaders who's going to sign, especially in Arme or on Armenian side. So it's much more, let's say, much more, let's say, dangerous to take this kind of the decision, at least how, how it was seen here. Uh, let's say not here. I mean, not I mean the Baku, but in general, when you look uh, as an outside observer. Third is the vital concerns. Uh, I think that there are disagreements between the Azerbaijan and Armenia, how they're going to, let's say, correspond these vital, uh, vital issues. And uh, then uh, there are no discussion about this transitional justice. There is no discussion about economic provisions. And there is no discussion about this, uh, let's say, obligation uh, of, well, let's say, third party signatures, at least to, let's say, to give the uh, the agreement any kind of the let's say status of the treaty, which uh, at least the obligation the parties to actually to respond to the third parties. So at this uh, this is other weakness that no one is uh, actually talking. So based on the five principles or based on the six principles, if, if they will, whatever they will find out, it's going not be uh, not uh, it's not going to be a comprehensive peace agreement right now. So we should understand this. This is one. Think that related to the uh, the peace agreement. So, because when you ask the questions, the scenarios. Okay, let's put the scenario that uh, the sides are going to sign the peace agreement in the coming months. So, uh, and whether based on this the, the three issues and based on this the other issues that is not uh, delivered or deliberately not put uh, in the negotiation, how it's going to affect this, uh, this overall the, the situation. This is one concern. Uh, so that's what this can also make that. Fail, failure of the peace agreement. Uh, in most of the peace segments, the side sign actually they, there are the, there is always the comeback of the insurgents. Uh, so between the conflict and the side sides. So 
So that's why these uh, issues should be properly addressed. Second scenario, unfortunately, is that scenario that is, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, again, uh, a much more big ex escalation, uh, not only the not only the, in the side of the international border areas, also uh, in the areas of the Russian patrolled, uh, Russian patrolled uh, the Armenian populated Karabakh. So this is uh, somehow the uh, grim uh, picture, but it is somehow also seems that uh, some of the uh, realistic, unfortunately, negative uh, issue as a, as a scenario. Uh, uh, the third scenario is that. Uh, finding a de-escalation and also finding an understanding of that, uh, let's say, the quick and um, uh, there's no quick and easy solutions. And uh, there should be also involvement of the, let's say, the different actors here to help uh, the sites uh, to come back and also not to see, not to make this as a top-down the pro process, as a peace, peace process. Also to involve the, as, as much as possible spoilers, as much of, uh, as the interested parties to the process in order to make as a, as a peace, not within the states, peace between the societies. So we are, mostly we are talking about how we, we can make the peace between the states, but also we should have take, taken into account that actually without uh, making the peace between the uh, societies, it's, no, it's not going to be a durable peace or it's not going to be uh, let's say, achievable peace uh, uh, in the future. So based, taking into account all of the things, how uh, we see future, I think it's also, uh, the future also depending on how the outside of the events are going to impact this uh, the process. Uh, from beginning of the let's say March, there were concerns. They, they were there were concerns that uh, the outside powers will not pay attention. But it's actually what we see right now. Also, uh, actors is active, and this is a good sign for overall the process. Uh, so actually, it proved our some of the, our estimation wrong uh, positively. So that's why uh, the time might be all of this, the, the actors uh, can come together and uh, to help, uh, let's say, to facilitate this negotiation uh, much faster and also to uh, give a, a clear message that uh, this uh, any escalation is actually not helping the size to come any, any kind of peace. Uh, the second uh, the issue is actually there should be a, a tangible results. So without any tangible results in political sphere between the states, uh, there will be less trust to any kind of uh, the final settlement. Uh, so tangible results can be uh, in many issues, uh, like uh, uh, the first, uh, probably the escalation, and second is that uh, people should believe that uh, there will not be any kind of the new escalation. Uh, and there might be some uh, much more active uh, uh, corporation active, let's say, uh, the contact between the sites, people to people contact in different uh, sphere. Uh, and uh, last uh, but not least, uh, we should make some of the issues as an as as normal. Might be uh, Seville told uh, begin of this webinar that we were optimistic a year ago or the half year ago or after the 2020 war that uh, the things can move forward much more easily. And there are chance of, or there is a windows of work in there. I, I do agree uh, with her assessment. Actually, uh, one of my my own, let's say, miscalculation or or misprediction. Let's put it like that. I believe that after 2020 war, there will not be any kind of, the, let's say, a high death toll or any escalation that could bring, let's say, more uh, victim from uh, any side. So. Unfortunately, we saw that uh, right now uh, this test toll is uh, too much. Uh, so, uh, so based on that, uh, also there was a question about how to move forward, how the EU and other actors can help. I think uh, uh, the EU, uh, EU and other actors can actually, um, based on this the peace agreement scenario, how I mean they can they can look. They should look to the in inclusiveness in the peace, peace agenda, and um, they shouldn't also. They should be much more visible process between the societies in, inside the society. And I can talk on, on behalf of what I see in Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, I see also the very uh, dangerous trend. This dangerous trend is related that uh, respect to the international law is actually is losing its 
importance. Uh, so, which actually people always believe and always put forward that the international law uh, uh, and the uh, testing integrity is an uh, important uh, element of any kind of the, let's say, uh, or, or important element of the, the world order. So, it's a kind of the collapsing in the eyes of the, the people. So this can create also, let's say, opponents in a kind of the renegotiated settlements, opponents of those things. And also, unfortunately, this can create more irredentist uh, sentiments in the society. Uh, and fortunately, I see that also there's a many, uh, let's say, people are reacting uh, this any kind of irredentist sentiments in the society. So it's very uh, gloomy picture, uh, but uh, let's say scenario, it's a decisive moment is that the scenario is a negotiation settlement uh, and taking the time and also in this inclusive way and also uh, capacity, vulnerabilities, and also the other issues, other the, the three important elements I, I, I thought uh, should be taken into account. And the last things about the peace agreement also, they should be also role of the international actors, EU, uh, the Russia, United States, and also the United Nations as a guarantor or witness actors of this uh, any kind of peace agreement. And it became much more important right now that uh, no one, it created a perception that if the, the side is going to sign the even peace agreement, uh, it's not going to be, it, it can be violated easily. So there should be some uh, the way of, uh, to make it that, that it's a legal obligation for the size about not only implementation, also not violating the, uh, the agreement. Thank you, Zaur. Um, <clears throat> okay. With a lot of things I agree, uh, but let me uh, start from saying that, uh, yes, it's overall gloomy, but uh, I also, but we are not there yet. We are not uh, at the bottom yet. I think there are still possibilities. And why? Uh, on two big accounts here, I think. One is that the consensus in the societies for the war isn't necessarily there uh, the way we had it until 2020. Yeah, on Azerbaijani end, we clearly had a clear consensus that we saw uh, play itself out in 2020 war <clears throat> in support of that war. There were maybe like 10 people who spoke up against that war. I don't see similar consensus uh, for the new phase of war, which essentially is taking place in the territory of Armenia uh, and no longer Karabakh. The, uh, so that's one. Uh, and in Armenia also, you see many, many more voices than you would have until 2020 talking about the necessity to normalize that wasn't there prior. So that's within the side is consensus for war. It doesn't exist yet. It might develop. The second uh, point is that the international community, as uh, we said, is not necessarily all that uh, keen on this war either. Yes, it's a proxy conflict, as I uh, was saying, in my view, the uh, US is trying to pull Caucasus in its column, uh, right? So Russia is not going to be interested in letting it go. And uh, having said that, nobody right now is interested in a war and uh, is actually probably interested in some form of a normalization or solution uh, for different reasons. Uh, from the US angle, the war is, uh, if anything, supports kind of Russia's playbook. Uh, and its contribution can be through helping to broker a peace. Same applies to the European Union. So in a way, getting uh, Caucasus is more democratic and uh, uh, kind of a bit away from the Russian orbit is uh, peace building. At the same time, Russia also doesn't have necessarily the resources currently to uh, go the war out. Yeah, so it's fully uh, clearly exhausted in Ukraine and uh, it is the most active mediator uh, and uh, arranging uh, at least day by day management of the conflict. So from Russian end as well to keep its role Actively, it seemed to be the uh, normalization or at least management, a uh, non escalation uh, seemed to be the obvious route again because escalation simply might uh, bring it to a place that, that it doesn't have the resources to compete with other external actors. And we have uh, uh, Turkey, I think they're also overlooking uh, a lot of times, might not be a popular view in Armenia, but I don't see Turkey being interested in further escalation at all. If anything, uh, what I'm seeing, I think it is signaling its interest towards normalization. Uh, and again, from quite self-interested point of view, it's never, it's for the last hundred years, it hasn't been a major actor. I think all the investment it put into 2020 more war, it got very little out of it. It has a few observers uh, in the joint mission. It didn't get any troops on the ground. It didn't get any kind of tangible economic benefits out of it. So it got very little out of a pretty heavy investment in, uh, uh, and any escalation probably will activate more US and Russia uh, and maybe Iran where Turkey might not be able to fully compete or at least not to the extent. 
that we would want to. So I see a potential for nobody really being interested from outside in a currently in a serious escalation. Uh, and neither the appetite in, in the societies uh, as such, at least to the extent we had until 2020. So that's an opening. That's not a foolproof. It's an opening that could be used. And it could only be used by the parties to the extent that they are interested in that and able to utilize essentially the absence of external pressures to escalate right now. Uh, uh, why are we, are we doing it? I agree with all the list, uh, most of the list of lists that you gave. Capacity, major issue. We, we, in Armenian end, uh, we have a pretty big state uh, and disconnect somewhat between the state and the government. Very little capacity essentially to go past top people negotiating, so implementation becomes a problem. On the Azerbaijani end, the state has been too centralized that again, in a way, state structure, foreign ministry, and so on are quite secondary. Um, so you have essentially a big problem of outside of top three to three people, how to move forward any agreement. Uh, we have trust building major issue. Uh, clearly, there is no trust between negotiators. They negotiate and go to war the day after. Uh, it's been quite continuous. So clearly, they don't trust the, any agreements they reach. Uh, and it also trickles down to also everyday and you know kind of mid-level people as well. We have nothing essentially uh, towards normalization and integration. We had 30 years of war. We had two big wars in you know uh, first Karabakh or second Karabakh war. We had lots of escalations, lots of human rights violations, uh, uh, lots of war crimes during the wars. And none of that being addressed. The displacement, what's happening with people return, compensations, none of that is being dealt with. That's on the transitional justice end. So that brings me to kind of quite unfortunate in a way point that I don't think a peace agreement at this time is possible. Uh, peace agreement understood as a you know comprehensive deal that kind of settle everything. Again, we have no international framework for it. The liberal democratic framework uh, essentially uh, uh, is out, which could mean human rights, minority rights, and what else, referenda, and so on. Yeah, so that's not functional. Uh, we have no kind of means group consensus that would be backing off a peace agreement. We have no civil societies in, in any serious sense uh, involved in this anymore, right? So we have no transitional justice, essentially no basis for peace agreement to be signed and hold. Where, and yet, at the same time, as I said in the beginning of this uh, second part of my talk, there is also no appetite really in anybody's sense to be for a full scale war either. So, how to square this off? My suggestion will be to, and I keep saying it, uh, but uh, I wrote an article recently about possible scenarios. Uh, and if uh, my colleagues wouldn't mind posting it, I would appreciate it so I don't have to repeat. Uh, so, it's in the chat window. So a lot of the scenarios are uh, in direction of escalation, right? Becoming proxy war area, becoming uh, you know something like South Ossetia, maybe this time Azerbaijan occupying part of Armenia and so on. Uh, but all of them are very dangerous and they are more realistic. Which the I don't think we have any kind of formerly popular scenarios such as Alan Island on the table, unfortunately either, which would be some form of uh, kind of de facto independence. They were uh, Karabakh staying in Armenia and all. Uh, so that's also not there, uh, again, because it required this liberal democratic framework. Uh, what we have really, what I'm calling the Cyprus scenario, and I'm increasingly uh, trying to advocate for it, which means putting, as in Cyprus of the past 50 years, which is putting the solution on hold and working on kind of a day by day management, but to normalization of relations as in very intentionally agreeing that we don't have a solution currently. Uh, we don't have the basis for uh, a solution currently. We don't have the international framework for it. And we need to heavily invest in uh, normalization of the relations, dealing with war crimes, dealing with um, where the border is, demarcation and what else, right? So there are a lot of issues to be solved, economic integration, uh, road openings, uh, all of these issues that seem to have in principle the agreement. I think we agreed in principle on demarcation. We agree on principle that roads should be open, right? Um, I think to that we should add transitional justice measures that are to um, work with everything, all the damage done over the past 30 years. And that will take good 20 years, frankly, and very intense work to work through, after which maybe we can develop some formula uh, for the full political settlement. So again, conflict management, 
coupled with intentional investment into normalization and reconciliation and economic integration, uh, I think is a much more has much more of a chance than an attempt to pull off a peace agreement that's gonna stick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Zaur. Uh, we're already receiving several uh, questions in the Q&A box, and I want to encourage everyone in the audience, please, if you have any questions uh, to our speakers, uh, please share them in the Q&A section. Uh, so uh, one of the questions I will ask to you is uh, about uh, your uh, perspective on what Phil mentioned about changing status of democracy and um, kind of prior de democracy being as a priority and its impact on the possibility of arriving at the peace agreement. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, that will actually use the exact the words or or exactly how he described it. So. Uh, if I can but, interject a second, I think yes. Uh, I, if anything, I said democracy is not a priority, so we don't need to think about that. It's not going to come back as a priority in the foreseeable future. So how do we build a new basis for an agreement that is not based on democracy as the precondition? So well, let, me, let me answer actually the, the Phil's last point. So I mean, I have a disagreement what Phil said, not disagreement that actually I don't uh, agree with his points, but I don't agree with the timeline because time, timeline for all events and how that the timeline can move is different from my understanding. Actually, the Phil is uh, proposing is a kind of the functional coexistence, which uh, the adversary has been not, uh, let's say, will give each other as a livable space, but will not, let's say, make this as a uh, uh, use of this opportunity for independence moves or any kind of they will not be any the worst station. So, uh, but unfortunately, I yeah, I do agree that uh, the, the 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 things that uh, the field is described that is important one uh, the let's say the past uh, the war transitional justice uh, economic issues and and all of the many things that actually we haven't uh, touched yet. Uh, but I I I don't see that they will be such uh, let's say. Uh, people uh, at this stage are will be ready uh, to give a uh, such time on to each other, uh, and uh, I don't think that even they will be goodwill from the sides. They can they can have a comprehensive peace agreement that could solve all of these issues. So I'm skeptic about comprehensive peace agreements at all. But what I believe that is achievable in the future is a framework framework agreement. Uh, it's a framework agreement is a kind of that uh, that there are some principles that actually sites are talking as always and it's uh, five principles and our is talking about uh, six principles so they can frame have a framework agreement that they have principle agreed they have they they are going to principally respect this and then they can move forward but this is also going to open up there will be many open questions especially in coming years that uh, the, uh, the role of the Russian peacekeepers. Uh, so, future of the Armenian population of Karabakh. Uh, security issues. The main issues that are will be. It's I don't know how it's going to be reflected in the framework agreement. It's not going to be reflected on how the government is going to deal with these issues. So that's why uh, I, I do agree that there are many things that we can come up. Uh, we need them might be ten years, uh, but active with active war ten years or fifteen years, but. Let's say, but without, uh, but also the the things are moving very forward. That I think without uh, at least accepting or uh, creating a, uh, some norms, it will be very hard uh, to wait uh, for, for 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 many years. And also, the I don't know how the sides are going to address this uh, the open questions in the coming months and coming years. So this also gives me an impression that uh, there will be more chance of coming back to the violence rather than moving forward with uh, any kind of uh, say, peaceful settlement. Uh, if I can uh, uh, quickly uh, say, I, I think we are not, I don't think we disagree in a sense, I'm not again, I, I think we need agreement and agreement as we go, but I meant, uh, the, I guess, is that that kind of a a uh, comprehensive peace agreement that's going to settle everything uh, currently doesn't seem to have a basis again because it was based on so many uh, kind of prior norms uh, 
that don't seem to hold up anymore. So that's where I see a problem of any comprehensive peace agreement essentially collapsing because these norms don't exist anymore internationally. Yeah, uh, but otherwise I do agree that there is a urgent need for a functional agreement. So and yes, I did mean some form of functional coexistence for settling uh, a lot of the ongoing problems uh, to the point of satisfaction of the parties so they don't need to continually escalate. Yeah, so fully we'll agree with that one. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is one more question from the audience, which considers the the road project, uh, and uh, I think um, it is um, uh, discussed in the media and by different experts how this is one of the key um, triggers of the escalation. The, the question is if it it is so, and uh, what what is the situation around this? Um, yeah. If as our two main tanks to go first. So I, I don't think that the, the transport uh, issue, connectivity, let's say, uh, is it was a trigger of the latest escalation. So there are, and there were many disagreements between the parties about how they see this, uh, uh, this uh, the, the connection between Azumin and Azerbaijan with the exclave Nazarbayev. So there were many disagreements between the parties, and there are still, but uh, as as we know from the diplomatic sources, actually, the sides were very uh, close to the reaching an agreement in the August meeting in Brussels. But actually, the priority has changed for Baku. Baku put forward uh, the peace agreement as the first, that's important one, and then actually look into the other issues. So uh, uh, the the issue is that, uh, you know, that there, there were existing, uh, existing uh, the ra railroad between this Azerbaijan and Armenia is uh, let's say uh, uh, during the Soviet time, but they were an existing uh, highway from the, especially from the Azerbaijan, the, the, the social part uh, to Nazarbayev. So that's why there were uh, many disagreements where and how it's going to pass, and also the regulation. Uh, so it, it's how, let's say, perceiving in Armenia as a, let's say, extraterritorial claim that Azerbaijan is, 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 is actually, uh, I, I, I have a little doubt about that because. Uh, even in 2020 ceasefire agreement, it was settled that who's going to protect this, uh, let's say, uh, link between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia and passing from Armenia and Sunni region, which actually Russian uh, security forces, uh, Russian FSP. So that's why there is no question about the security of this, uh, but there is a question about this, the free passage and how this is going to be regulated. I think uh, there are many things uh, it, it can be done. So the, I don't think that it's out of the table right now. This is a, something that is achievable, achievable that is, uh, let's say, also achievable in a way that also not will raise the question about the sovereignty in any, in, 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 in any party. So that's why this is achievable, but I don't think that is a trigger of uh, latest solution. Oh, important though here that it, everything, and this could be, yeah, so roads and connectivity and economics and kind of cooperation or, or at least some kind of economic links, could be or should be uh, in principle uh, a step towards trust building normalization uh, and moving towards solution so far it's the opposite uh and everything right now is perceived uh, as a threat uh, or it's uh, attempted to be implemented in a manner that's somehow going to harm the other party or at least that is the perception right so on the armenian end clearly the opening of the road between um, uh, for azerbaijan and uh, Nakhjavan, Azerbaijan mainland, and Nakhjavan is seen as, yes, in some form, uh, a danger, either violation of its territorial integrity or potential danger for escalation down the road and so on. So we have this that, again, even those provisions that should be working in favor of normalization are currently working in almost to escalate the tensions. Uh, so that's where really, uh, in my view, developing some form of a functional coexistence concept where we see this as steps to our solution is important. But that brings me also to the second point that Zaur earlier raised, the capacity question. Uh, so we have also very weak technical expertise. It's very hard to answer a question and clearly on the government and governments and uh, you have not enough work done or not uh, either not enough expertise or not enough work done to A, say what these roads are, right? And two, if they are even in place, three, how they're gonna function and to move this from, uh, again, high level talks to any form of kind of functional implementation place. So there's a big need here for a support. 
uh, which I don't think gonna come from the governments. Uh, we don't see that capacity uh, uh, in place, neither in terms of public relations nor in terms of implementation. Uh, and here I think uh, either outside actors in a very technical sense could help. An example being Swiss who have a lot of experience in technical part of this, this agreement development, right? Not as people who lead this negotiations, but who come specifically with technical expertise and who will be trusted because they are neither Armenian or Azerbaijani, so they don't have a stake, right? Or this is a place where you can bring civil society experts. Because here you can have quite nationalistic people, frankly, or you know, who are not necessarily in love with the other side in any form and shape, but who understand the necessity of some form of functional yeah, uh, organizing and settling these issues so they don't escalate further. So I do see potential expertise in civil societies or societies and potentially internationally that is not being called for or uh, utilized. It is really kept on the level of two, three people and not moving towards a place of considering the implementation, which could be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more question from the audience is uh, regarding, um, well, it goes, uh, what should, from your perspective, the EU do regarding purchase of gas from Azerbaijan? Is there a chance to use it as a leverage to push for peace talks? What about conditionalities? Is it an instrument for preventing new aggressions or does it contradict any form of diplomatic prevention and peace building efforts? Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I can answer specifically that question that uh, so far there has seemed to be quite a lot of disconnect, right, between uh, kind of economic cooperation uh, or bilateral cooperation between either EU or any other actor uh, and uh, the peace agreement. I think United States is moving a little bit in that direction, more on the Congress end than on the executive branch end in uh, essentially escalating its rhetoric towards the need to stop violence uh, uh, normalize and potentially talking about sanctions, uh, specifically on Azerbaijan uh, in this case. Uh, so that's the first time I think we are seeing really this in recent years, such a development. Uh, but in principle, uh, yes, uh, I think, the, and I think should be uh, essentially, and uh, not only towards Azerbaijan, right? I think any kind of, uh, specifically now towards Azerbaijan, but overall towards both sides, that kind of any kind of uh, yeah, support and uh, serious, cooperation that will also keep Azerbaijan, Armenia and the region in at least some kind of balanced uh, column and not uh, simply a subject of regional uh, great power struggles, right? So it should be up, uh, I think, tied in to, to some form of human rights provisions and the necessity of uh, normalization. So uh, kind of closing your, otherwise we end up in a situation where economic cooperation between the West and uh, individual countries and are contributing to the war right now. Uh, so would you like to add anything? We, uh, we have a minute left, so maybe let's uh, try to close. And if you have any uh, concluding remarks, anything that you would like to... Um, no, actually ask. about this EU question, I think, uh, I mean, I think uh, there is also somehow a little bit of a wrong perception about this, uh, about let's say EU's desire to compensate at least some uh, some uh, the gas flow from uh, from Russia with Azerbaijan gas. So that's why EU is trying to be a little bit, let's say, the pro-Azerbaijan or Azer EU has actually have a political interest. Uh, so surely EU has a political interest about it. My security or no war uh, and not having any war in the region is a priority for EU. But uh, you know that this, uh, the, uh, what, what was signed in Baku, is, it was a political declaration uh, that uh, I mean, from beginning when the trans Adriatic pipeline actually uh, announced in 2013 uh, that it was uh, written and it was clear to everyone that when and how uh, this capacity is going to be expanded. So that's why this is nothing new, but what we see only this, uh, let's say, uh, the, let's say uh, the commitment actually repeated or there was a political boost. So other than that, I think, uh, so the things that are related to the Azerbaijan export of the gas to the EU is coming from the realities from 2013 and what was written and what was signed. So I don't think that this has a huge influence to the decision-making process of the EU, uh, but uh, what have uh, might be uh, impact to the EU or US that uh, 
uh, the Phil also mentioned that about the state of want to see that uh, this uh, this situation can create a additional condition for Russia to increase their let's say the role increase their let's say the foot on the ground uh, in the region so so that's why the, this is uh, that's why this is a common interest of EU uh, let's say and uh, uh, overall the western countries uh, is kind of here uh, so so that's as a, as a conclusion uh, what I can say that okay um, first of all we are talk last things that I think we should mention I'm, I'm trying to also mention about this we always always uh, paying attention to the role of the civil society or the groups who can create actually positive development within the society uh, but uh, unfortunately what I don't see that uh, there is uh, there's no uh, let's say the uh, uh, interest right now I haven't seen in Azerbaijan society groups coming together, actually creating a platform that, uh, let's say, offering alternatives, whether this is a political solution, whether this is about the social issues, whether this is about transitional justice or other issues. So that's why I see uh, less activism that uh, it's not about, there's no political constraints. I don't see any political constraints, but there's no actually, might be interest, might be dysfunctionalism, that I, I think there should be much more, let's say, uh, this should come from the underground and this they can play at this on the level of the society. And this can uh, this this could be also the explainer. Phil mentioned about this uh, technical expertise for the peace agreement, but also there is no so explainer, uh, let's say, any peace agreement or anything between Azerbaijan and Armenia to their society in a very, in, in a very, very let's say, in a way that other people can understand. So there should be tools, uh, there should be people that will actually explain, not uh, create a condition that this is not creating, let's say, the danger for so sovereignty or, let's say, in a society, this can create, a, let's say, dividends for, for society. So that's why the role of the experts, the role of the social society, is not undermined by external actors, it's undermined by themselves. If I can okay. also add, yeah, what? Uh, towards the end, I, I agree on uh, this last point, but I also see uh, something good uh, developing potentially there. I think the, uh, this collapse, uh, why I think we don't have civil society currently active is because uh, in a way, again, the previous framework of civil society collapsed, essentially. So it was heavy investment into professionalization, institutionalization, uh, well-paying jobs, and they were just that, a lot, most of them. Are just there. And I think that's a good thing. Frankly, uh, because uh, it was kind of self frustration, <laughs> as in those who were there for money simply left the field and they should not have been there in the first place. Uh, but it leads to a crisis and uh, somewhat of a vacuum, which I think is being slowly filled by people who are now there not for the money uh, and for the genuine interest. And I see at least two groups mobilizing, slowly filling this vacuum. One is more kind of idealistic people who are peace activists and who are genuinely pro peace. And two, uh, people who are kind of, again, more on the technical end of the conversation, whatever their ideological positions, uh, also believing that, you know, economists, uh, lawyers, and so on, who can see a space for, you need, again, this functional coexistence concept, you need to deal with issues of demarcation and roads and how they function and security of them and so on. So I think these are these two groups who have, again, very kind of uh, different interests from the former professional civil society uh, actors. And I think that, should be built on and that's where I do see an important role for EU, for example, and other external actors, noticing who are these kind of a very genuinely uh, actively involved people and working with them to start you know, rebuilding the civil society. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, our time is up. Uh, I want to apologize to our audience members whose questions we uh, couldn't address uh, during this webinar, but we will do our best to have other uh, webinars and we'll keep your questions in mind uh, and we'll definitely be following up with this. And of course, let's hope there won't be uh, more escalations and there will be um, a way uh, to de-escalate and find negotiated painful, slow, but negotiated solutions. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you.